Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and we have finally arrived at the end of my series on Leonidas Polk, the warrior bishop of the Confederacy. Don't forget, in two weeks I'll be debuting the series on Winfield Scott Hancock. When we last left Polk, he had rejoined the Army of Tennessee and pulled back to Marietta, Georgia. In front of the Confederate lines was a rise called Pine Mountain that Southern commanders were concerned about. It was the 14th of June, and a group of rebel commanders would climb the rise to get a better understanding of the tactical situation of the area. The night before, on June 13th, in a late-night conversation with his roommate, the young sugar planter turned general, Randall Lee Gibson, Polk expressed to him that it was only a matter of time before he and Gibson and all their fellow Confederates would surely achieve our independence and what a day it would be when we could all return to our dear city of New Orleans, bringing peace and liberty to our people. He even described how Jackson Square would appear decorated by our banners and filled with rejoicing people. But then the bishop changed his tone. Rising up in bed, Gibson related, he said, No, my dear boy, even this may never be, for experience in life and true philosophy have taught me to set my heart upon nothing, nothing in this world. Our triumphs, our joys, can be celebrated only in the world and life to come. After that comment, they went to bed. Polk awakened on Tuesday the 14th, and Johnston requested for two of his corps commanders, Polk and Hardy, to travel with him to Pine Mountain to view the Union Army and to lay out a strategy to combat the ever-encroaching enemy troops under Sherman. The three men dismounted, leaving their staff behind, and climbed the rise, housing General William Bates' Infantry Division and the New Orleans Washington Artillery. The cannoneers warned the commanders that the Union cannons had found their range and were lobbing shells into the fortifications. Sergeant Rice C. Bull of the 123rd New York Infantry reported it this way, Whenever a Johnny Reb showed himself to make observations or give signals with their flags, our shells began to drop on the crest of the hill. The boys located in the vicinity gathered around the battery to watch the sport. The Johnnies could see when the guns were fired from the smoke. We could see them dodge out of sight before the shells reached them. Often when a shell exploded or passed them, they would come out and wave their hats. They seemed as well pleased as we were. The three generals, exposed out in the open, became quite a view for the peering Union troops about a half mile away. General Sherman stated, how saucy they are. Then he addressed one of his artillerymen. Captain Simonson, can you send a shell right on top of that knob? I noticed a battery there and several general officers near it. I'll try, Simonson replied. His gunners of the 5th Indiana Light Artillery, previously told to conserve their limited ammunition, jumped to obey Sherman's overriding instructions. Corporal Benjamin McCollum got busy adjusting the brass sights on his 10-pounder, an artillery rifle able, with fair accuracy, to fire a shell that was three inches across and seven inches long. He awaited Simonson's fire command. Sherman looked on with his glass. Ah, Captain, a little too high. Try again with a shorter fuse. Corporal McCollum complied. Up went the glass to his eye. Oddly enough, a kinsman to Polk named William Harrison Polk, a member of the 21st Indiana Infantry Regiment, was watching this all take place. He would recount what happened next to Leonidas Polk's son later. It was a 10-pounder parrot of the 5th Indiana Battery, Captain Simonson commanding. A young deserter had come into our lines and the man was handed a powerful field glass and asked to name who the Confederate officers were. He named them and I remember he called your father's name last, saying General Johnston, General Hardy, and General Polk. Then Sherman said to the officer in command, turn a gun to the front and give the bishop a morning salute. The first shot went high, skipping over the top. When two of the Confederate officers walked away, the third lingering behind and retiring a little later, as I remember it. Simonson jumped off his horse and said, let me sight that gun, which he did very carefully. The solid shot from the Union gunners, along with the whistling mini balls from the sharpshooters, had convinced the group of officers to scatter, except for Polk, who stayed. The morning salute, carefully aimed by Simonson, careened through the air and pierced the upper torso of General Polk. A soldier yelled out that they had killed General Polk. Upon hearing the news, Polk's aide and son-in-law, William Gale, rushed over to the bishop's body. He saw the general nervously work in his jaw, and then the body went limp. 
He hurried off to get a litter. Generals Hardy and Johnston attempted to hurry over to help him in what way they could, but a colonel stopped them and warned them that the South had already had a huge loss and they shouldn't expose themselves to danger. Polk's personal escort and security, the Orleans Light Horse Cavalry, galloped up to the hill, put his body on a litter, and removed it to Polk's headquarters. Some who beheld the corpse, it was said, gasped with horror. The missile passed through Polk's chest, carrying away his heart, not lacerating his chest at all, lacerating dreadfully his back. Upon hearing the news of the bishop's death, General Hood remarked, I had grown to love General Polk with my whole heart. He was so noble, so generous, and such an able soldier. After being transported to Marietta, the body was placed in a make-do plain box coffin and then put in a larger box filled around with powdered charcoal as a guard against odor and leakage. The Confederates evacuated Pine Mountain after dark, left behind to be found the next day by Yankees in the blood-matted grass where Polk had died were fragments of his ribs and arm bones. A newspaper man named David Cunningham and a doctor friend saved them as souvenirs. Some federal soldiers dipped handkerchiefs in Polk's gore, whether as a sacred relic or to remind them of a traitor, said Cunningham. The body went by train to Atlanta, where he laid in state at St. Luke's Parish, a small church just a few weeks old, assembled from wood and nails donated by merchants for its construction and assembled by soldiers who were carpenters stationed in and around Atlanta. The church looked like a small schoolhouse and had mostly been utilized to help refugees streaming in from the Georgia countryside as Sherman's troops invaded the state. On June 15th, the body was viewed by thousands of people. Below the head, the torn remains were sensibly concealed beneath a Confederate flag, covered in an array of magnolia blossoms and a cross of white roses. The general's sword lay alongside the casket. His body was then moved to Augusta, Georgia, where a second, more elaborate funeral could take place on June 29th, a special day for the church because that is the day of remembrance for the martyrdoms of St. Peter and St. Paul. The orchestrator of the funeral, drawing similarities between the bishop and the saints being killed by, in his view, heretics. It took place at St. Paul's Church in that city, with General James Longstreet in attendance. Having been wounded at the Battle of the Wilderness in May, he was recovering nearby. The Reverend Stephen Elliott presided over the service. The following is an excerpt from his eulogy for Polk. And now ye Christians of the North, and especially ye priests and bishops of the church, who have lent yourselves to the fanning of the fury of this unjust and cruel war, do I this day, in the presence of the body of my murdered brother, summon you to meet us at the judgment seat of Christ, that awful bar where your brute force shall avail you nothing, where the multitudes you have followed to do evil shall not shield you from an angry God, where the vain excuses with which you have varnished your sin shall be scattered before the bright beams of eternal truth and righteousness. I summon to you that bar in the name of that sacred liberty which you have trampled underfoot, in the name of the glorious constitution which you have destroyed, in the name of our holy religion which you have profaned, in the name of the temples of God which you have desecrated, in the name of a thousand martyred saints whose blood you have wantonly spilled, in the name of our Christian virgins whom you have violated, in the name of our slaves whom you have seduced and then consigned to misery, and there I leave justice and vengeance to God. After the service, he would be laid to rest in Augusta. However, in 1945, he and his wife would be reinterred in New Orleans. Lieutenant William Palfrey summed up Polk's death nicely. While mourning our loss, Palfrey wrote, we cannot but return thanks to God for his great mercy and taking of the four generals present on Pine Mountain, the one most easily spared. In view of the position lately occupied by General Polk, it may be said with all respect for his many shining qualities that his death was not inopportune. He was second in command, and in the event of any accident to General Johnston, which heaven forbid, the charge of the army would have been in the hands of one not equal to the emergency. General Polk lacked the qualities most essential for a great commander, quickness of perception, tact, enterprise, and energy. He would have been at the mercy of a vigorous adversary. This is the general estimate of his military ability. William Gale, Polk's son-in-law, went to Jefferson Davis and talked with the president about Polk's death. Davis was distraught over losing such a longtime friend. At some point in the conversation, he was beside himself with grief. He had lost two close West Point friends. First, Albert Sidney Johnston, 
and now Polk. After the meeting, Gail wrote to Kate, Polk's daughter, herself grieved at the loss of her father and more broadly the Confederacy, that the downward trajectory of the South reminded him of Leonidas Polk's oft-repeated epitaph for the Confederacy, always too late. <laughs>